welcome teachers. This session is pretty much a roundtable discussion with our three panelists about what teaching in the fall is going to look like with the uncertainties that we have. Um, and so I'm going to kind of start the panel. I'll let our panelists introduce themselves and I will um, lead us with some discussions and some questions. And then towards the end, I will open it up to all the teachers in this session. Uh, if you want to ask questions to our panelists, to add it in the Q&A tool at the bottom, the, the bottom bar of the Zoom chat, and um, I will ask the questions for you. So on that note, uh, how about we have our panelists introduce ourselves? And I know you can't see your order, so I'll just call out your name and if you wanna uh, introduce yourself. So Kim, we'll start with you. Well, hello everyone. My name is Kim Bearden. I am the co-founder and executive director of a school called the Ron Clark Academy in Atlanta. We are a middle school, but we are also a place that provides professional development for educators. They come and sit in our classes, watch us teach and take methods and ideas back to their schools. And we also do virtual training. And my most important title is that of teacher. I teach language arts every single day when school is in session, fifth and sixth grade. Awesome, thank you. Welcome, Kim. And then Darius. My name is Darius White. I'm in Oakland. I'm a first generation college graduate as well as a first generation teacher. Um, I teach in San Francisco and I also teach online from grades K through eight during you know, the evening and then during the day, the daytime regular school job is nine to 12. So nice to meet you all. I'm coming from way of Texas, go Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, welcome Darius and then Wendy. So I am an educator with adult, generally adult learners and it's with largely adult learners who are also refugees and uh, so I am coming from Atlanta Georgia and I am so happy to meet you all and thanks great so thank you so much for the three of you joining us and taking the time I'm sure you have a lot to do right now with summer coming to a close and fall semester around the corner and so Kind of on that open question to the three of you is what does your to-do list look like right now <laughs> well i think like all of us we have multiple to-do lists even more than normal because we have our if school is in person list and then we have if school is in a modified version list and then we have if our school is a virtual list and so trying to do all of those and orchestrate those um currently in atlanta the plan is that we will be starting virtually but we're so hopeful that before too long we'll be able to be in person so really just trying to coordinate how to take care of my staff, how to feel like they're prepared, they're calm, they're ready, and also how to let our students still have that sense of excitement, that sense of anticipation for school and, and making sure that we have all those relationships and bonds built. So it's a lot. <laughs> Do you know when school is starting for you, Kim, or? We actually start a little bit later. Um, we start in September, September the 3rd, but there is actually, I don't know if it's going to pass, but even currently as we speak, the state of Georgia is considering passing something that would delay all school until September 8th. Don't know if that's going to happen, but most schools here usually start about mid-August. And so definitely going to be a little bit later than normal. Yeah, I totally agree. It's gonna start a little bit longer, but it's still this sort of weird, understanding of what is the what. And so we're all figuring it out. Uh, I would say for me, uh, personally, I'm just taking a step back and trying to think, you know, you know, systemically, like, what am I walking into, right? Before I get into the lesson planning, I got my journal by my, you know, night on my nightstand. Um, I'm also, you know, Instagramming my former students who graduated, like, you know, what went well in the spring during your college years, or that semester, as well as talking to my students that you know, graduated from my class last year. So I have a lot of student interviews to do. Um, I have some notes to take, a lot of books to read. And then eventually, uh, mid-August, we'll be doing some PD where I get to collaborate with my colleagues. So that's kind of what my to-do list looks like right now. And so for Wendy and Darius, what is lesson planning on that to-do list look like? And what, how has transitioning to this virtual environment been? And so I'll start and then Darius, I, I'm sure you can concur. My lesson planning is working out lesson management systems, which mm -hmm. I have to learn. And um, so for one, it's uh, Blackboard. However, Google Classrooms. So we're trying to balance out those two. And then we're also trying to just make sure that students have textbooks and then other things that really kind of compile just two to three more weeks of learning. 
Yeah, I concur. Uh, I concur, Miss Wendy. I think I've just been thinking about priorities. Uh, I, I've been taking kind of, a, again, a systemic kind of view and kind of larger view of, you know, course objectives. Uh, I'm in the English department at my high school. So thinking about course objectives, um, learning skills. And then I think right now, most important that I want to uh, really emphasize to my department is relational skills, right? Our kids need community more than ever. And they're, you know, they're going through a grieving period. So uh, I haven't really gotten down to the lesson plans in terms of the activities, but I've been really thinking about what are the needs, you know, and what are the needs I anticipate of our young people, whether that's internet, whether that is um, having devices, and also keeping in mind that, you know, when you're in, you're in these kids' houses, you're in my house right now, you're in my small little apartment in Oakland, so you're going to see yeah. Theo, Thea, Lola, Lolo, you know, you're going to see everybody. So just trying to figure out and reconstruct what community looks like and what that means has been kind of my um, current focus for the last like week or so. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about with this online teaching space. Even though I do teach K through eight, um, I just got off a call with my little ones and you're sitting there with the baby sister, the mom, the dad, the grandma, and we're all right. just, you know, talking about reading, so. I agree. No, that's so great to hear, Darius. A lot of our teachers are commenting in the chat box about community is so important. Yay, yes, most social emotional support and just understanding that you know the students aren't in the classroom anymore you really are sitting there with their family members um and then for kim with such your, your interesting role of being a teacher but also leading and being a school leader in that sense what are ways in which you've used that kind of hybrid experience to really inform you know professional development or ways to support your teachers or do you have any advice for our current teachers um facing these problems that darius and wendy have highlighted well, I, yeah, I, I actually, I love that Darius was talking so much already about relationship building because that's truly what it is. And so, you know, first we do have to take care of our staffs, our faculties. As educators, we have to bond together, right? It's like when you're on the airplane, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, right, to be able to care for your kids. And so how do we build that community with our staff to make sure that they feel empowered? Because right now I know a lot of educators are feeling completely overwhelmed, completely unsure of what, in the uncertainty. So we do a lot with our staff first to make sure that we're checking in with them often. And we do some fun things, y'all. Like we had a virtual faculty lounge. Like our counselor came up with this idea, but basically it's just a place you don't have to check in, but it's stop by, drop in, pop in. And we just have a Zoom open for like from this time to this time. And it's really a place where we just come in and we look at each other, but we talk, we, you know, we banter, we share ideas and things like that. So we've done some things like that. And we make sure that when we're sending out information to our staff, it's not just very, you know, turn this in, do this, this date, this date, but we have a lot of, how you doing, really? And we have a lot of interactive conversations in smaller groups with our staff. To empower our staff too, we've also set up committees to help us. And so we've gone to the people on our staff who are experts in different areas, such as those people who really are great at setting up those structures. When this whole happened in the spring, some of us used Google Classroom, some of us did not, but immediately a team who used it set out, made a set of instructional videos for all of us so that we could have everything in a central place, everything uniform, because we thought that would help parents be able to navigate things. And then as we're commuting all of this to, communicating this to parents, there's been a lot of things we've done too. Even during the summer, we have done things like, uh, we had a we have parent power hour every couple of weeks where parents can pop in on Zoom. And we even talk about everything from deep breathing exercises to resources that are available to them, to just letting them share about things that they're trying to process as this is going on. And we even had during the summer and even during our spring break last year, we've had virtual experiences like fam RCA family vacation. Like uh, we had a yoga night where everybody's on Zoom doing yoga with their families or everybody is doing kitchen band concerts where we're playing instruments and things. Because one thing I think that we've all learned from this is that there is, even though in the midst of how hard this is, there's power to this ability to connect. Like when Darius is saying the whole family is sitting there, that's a powerful thing that we've never actually probably had before. So how do we take that piece of it and capitalize on it so that we really build this big community, even if it has to be virtually? And I will say, Kim, I can only imagine how exciting the virtual events are with your staff. I attended Hotel RCA. It <laughs> felt like I was in a hotel and was entertained uh, the entire time. Um, on that note, so Wendy, for you, like all this community building that Kim's recommending and even Darius with the little ones, what, do you find a similar experience when it comes to teaching adults or, you know, refugees of anything in that sort? What, is that, what has that been like for you? Yes, so we teach adult mothers and a, a requirement is that 
they need to have a preschooler. And so we do a preschool education as well as teaching mothers. And so there is always that balance of just kind of trying to engage both mothers and teachers and to make sure that everyone is connected. Uh, and it's been difficult here lately, but yes. And you know, with all of this exciting like thinking and trying to translate and design things from in-person to virtual, I don't want to put you on the spot, Darius, but I do know you are a design thinking fellow and you spend a lot of time thinking. And for our audience, um, Darius and I went to school together and I know Darius is very clever and very intelligent and very good at designing. Took a lot of cues from Darius back in the day. So Darius, what does that entail and how have you used that experience to help you design, you know, classroom fall 2020? All right, let me be honest with you all, right? We're just talking like it's you and me in my living room, okay? Um, I know it's a fancy term and it's, it's taken from product design. And I know I'm one of the biggest skeptics I hate in education when they have another buzz thing and it's like, okay, they give it another bell and whistle. Um, but the design thinking process, right? I know people think about it in terms of products, you know, like, oh, is that how the Apple Watch is created in the Tesla truck? Yeah, sure. Um, for me as a teacher, um, I was tasked with um, integrating that kind of design thinking process in my classroom as an English teacher. And I'll just give you the short and skinny of it, right? It's human-centered. So I think first and foremost, being student-centered and human-centered are one and the same, right? I think the more that we have student choice and voice, the better, right? Because, you know, I tell my kids, you're my teammates. We're co-collaborators, right? Um, if you're a sports nut like I am, I call myself a player coach, right? I don't think I'm any better or worse than the kids like I have some information yeah I have like a degree or whatnot um, but the design thinking is really about empowering kids to be agents as opposed to kind of passive recipients and so it's just essentially it's creative problem solving right the process is a linear um, you know case in point I'll share a little example my seniors I started this process what two years ago I believe and so my seniors my senior class is kind of a uh, kind of an ethnic studies course where my kids get into kind of critical race theory um, you know, it's kind of broad, they get into feminist theory, they get into um, talking about uh, immigration reform. So essentially we talk about identity. And so I tasked them with, hey, your job is to figure out how to make something applicable and accessible to, to kind of engender and facilitate conversation around race, gender, all the isms, the phobias, you know what I'm saying, right? And they have to teach it to grades second all the way to seventh, right? They have to figure out, all right, what are we gonna do? And so the process, we start with uh, empathy. Right, and you learn some skills such as empathy. So they have to interview young people about, well, what do young people want? Well, what would they, you know, expect or want from a presentation, right? And do they want a presentation? I think when you hear group project, you think, oh, it's gonna be some slides and oh, it's gonna be 20 people talking and it's really boring. But the design thinking process allows kids to get out, right? They're learning those communal, communal skills, relational skills, they're interviewing people. And it's since they're using all the data to kind of come up with a, I don't like business terms, but I'll just use it for right now to come up with a product to figure out, okay, all right, is this worth it? And then they go and test it out. They go test, they get feedback from the audiences. And so essentially, uh, I think one year, the kids came up with a puppet show, right? They came up with a puppet show that they were talking about race and gender with these little second graders. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. Um, another group wrote a children's book. If you're familiar with Mo Willems, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know. I just started reading children's book in the last couple of years, like baby, baby book. So uh, the kids did a book where it was a, no words, it was just all pictures. And so they were trying to teach the kids kind of emotional intelligence. And so the kids, uh, my students spent a lot of time um, drawing out these bears with different faces to see the different emotions from page to page so the kids can track it. And so then the kids had this conversation between this, about this black bear and this white bear. And they're like, what are they talking about? Um, so long story short, I don't want to lecture you about it. Um, do I think the process is useful? Yeah, but am I gonna sit here and tell you that it's the only one? No, it's just another tool in your tool belt. Again, I think some of the dopest takeaways from my seniors were uh, it was team oriented. Um, they got to go out and really talk to people because I think a lot, of, a lot of things in education is from a top down model and people don't really get to integrate and to talk across because um, there's, there's, I don't know, I have my own political views on education. I think uh, we need to move away from a, domi a domination model where it's like the teacher knows everything, if anything, um, I want to invite my kids to conversation and dialogue. Yeah, I'll provide the plays like a player coach in the reading, but I want them to really um, figure out how to integrate it in their own worlds and then how to use that information to become agents and change and social justice advocates. So as a design thinker, um, I think the biggest takeaway is it teaches the kids empathy, they're co-collaborators, 
And the hardest part as a teacher, as you're watching this, is to defer to the kids, right? Because you just don't know where it's going to go. It's a nonlinear process, right? You have check-ins with them, but, you know, the lesson planning is very sparse. And so you do kind of workshops to help kids think about, all right, what are you doing? And no, it's not a flipped classroom. I'm still there. I'm still in person. Um, it's just that you're deferring to those young people and they're, they're going to take it wherever they're going to go. And sometimes the products aren't great, but they learn a lot from the process. So um, the design thinking has been really edifying for me because it, it tells me to take a step back and be humble and just to witness their greatness, right? Because who am I, right? I'm just there to nurture it, right? So that's how I feel about design thinking in the classroom as an English teacher. Right, well, and that's great too, Jerry. It, it kind of connects with some things that an earlier panel discussed here at Quizlet. And I can tell where um, you got some of your teaching thinking because it reminds me of that word metacognition where we spent a long time reflecting, reflecting, reflecting about what we're teaching. And so on that note, um, Wendy, who we've chatted about your teenage sons, what has it been like for them in this experience? And, you know, hearing educators like Kim and Darius making these moves for that cohort of student learning, how does that, what has it been like for you to witness that? So I think it's been exciting and depleting, both. And exciting because they get to do everything they wanted to do. So one who is now first year in college, you're at your first semester, yay, and then COVID hits. And then, oh, time to go back home. And well, what were you thinking? What did you want to design? What were your passions in life? And so, he has to rethink it and do it. And then another one is last uh, last um, year in high school, a small school in Atlanta, TNS, and yet a pow empowered school. Okay, so what do you want to do? Okay, I want to build an ice cream business. So it's been weird for us because you still want to do a traditional route with schooling. However, you still want to pursue your passions and then just working on those both designs and how do you do it? Right, and then hearing all these different ideas and you know, just like this passion for it. A question I have for all of you, and I'm seeing it come up in the chat, um, but a reminder, put your questions in the Q&A tool. How are each of you staying motivated and inspired to do this work and you know, inspire others? It takes a lot of energy I think people who haven't been teachers, and I think the, the eyesight being on teachers now is they don't realize how much work it takes or when you're having a bad day, you don't show up to the classroom and letting your students know you're having a bad day, right? Like you, that's just not something you do. And so in this time, that, that weight will say on the shoulders of the teachers is even bigger and heavier. So what are ways that you're staying motivated or maintaining your mental health and, and you know, doing, doing the good work? Um, I'll start with saying, I always tell teachers that it's important to surround yourself with people who fuel your soul. And by that, I've, I've listened, I've been watching a lot of the things come up and some of you feel very supported in your schools and some of you feel like you're an island all by yourself and you're not getting the support that you deserve and that you should have during this time. And so you have to advocate for yourself and find someone to connect to. And it could be somebody you meet virtually. So it could be somebody, you know, as states away, but some people whom you can get together with on a regular basis and, and share ideas and collaborate. Like I'm energized listening to Wendy and Darius talk right now. And we just met a few moments ago. So we got to seek out those kinds of relationships, those kinds of opportunities to help us stay motivated when we are feeling overwhelmed. And the other thing I just hope that educators will always remember, um, during times of difficulty, those people who were there for you, um, they will never forget you. And so I want you to know that even though we're all bearing this heavy weight, and then we feel like we have to lift up our students as well, the kids that you're gonna be teaching this year and the ones that you finished out last year with, there will come a time when this is all over with. You know, we pray that it, we don't know what it's all gonna look like, but one day this will be a memory. Those students, they may forget many teachers they have, but they're going to remember you because during this time, the things that you did to try to build those relationships, even if it was through a screen, those ways that you tried to help them find their, you know, help them uh, find their creativities, their passions, the way that you let them explore things, all those different things and the way that you built that rapport, they will remember that. And so in days when I feel just like overworked and overwhelmed and underappreciated and tired, I keep trying to, because we all feel that way, I try to remember that, um, that we're really just trying to plant seeds 
that will take root and we can't lose sight of how significant what we do is you know when you when you affect a kid you don't only affect that st student you affect everybody with whom that student will interact one day right and so the exponential impact that we have it's it's unbelievable and we have to remind ourselves of that and we have to take time to 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 really receive that and understand that we are making a difference even when sometimes even in the media right now we feel like we're getting beaten up or making a mm -hmm. difference I so agree. I so agree. Darius, Wendy, do you want to share how you're staying inspired? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it was so well stated, Kim. I, I agree. And we just have to realize how much of an impact we make and just keep going on. And, and there are times, let me tell you something, but I think, I think most of us on here, I know there's a lot of people have had a moment where you've been in a little ball crawling your, crying your eyes out because I have to, I mean, and you know, and if you're not a crier, you felt you were crying on the inside. And it could be that you had a, a good roof over your head and you have a job and you have food in your belly, but there's just so much pain in this world. And, and even if you are in a good situation because we're educators, we're wired to feel pain for our students who are in pain. And so um, that's that's part of it, but you've got to, find people that you can speak with who can remind you of your worth and your value and they can also get you excited about even in the midst of this how can i do something differently and how can i take advantage of the things i've learned during this time you've got to really be intentional about that maybe now more than ever before mm. i would say we we gotta we gotta put the c word in education in our classrooms that c word is care man we don't talk enough about care Right, the, you know, teach, in education, we have such a load, right? Because we're talking, we're we're teaching the whole kid, right? Um, one of the things that's been really deep for in the last couple of years, uh, where I've really been trying to better myself, like take care of myself, like I got my kale, you know, I eat my granola, <laughs> you know, I'm trying, right? Um, I think about care, I think about connection, I think about radical collaboration, compassion, and when I say care. That may mean, you know, doing your nails. That may mean like having a day with the kids where we, we cook together, right? And it's not about the books. Um, I think we don't talk enough about care. That gets into the mental health, um, because I think unfortunately the way our education system has been set up, uh, and you know, this is just my point of view, I think it divides us uh, socially and internally, right? Because I, I hate seeing my seventh graders not have that burning creativity anymore because they went through six years of crappy teaching and learning experiences, right? And I think, unfortunately, as our kids go through, they get beside themselves. And then here I am when I get them in high school trying to help restore them, right? Because I think they come to us whole, but they don't always leave us when they go to the 12, 13 years of our education system. So I want to bring, you know, the C word into this conversation. I think Kim spoke to that. Um, care. Um, also, if you're spiritual, I'm not saying religious, but if you're spiritual, I think there's some internal work we got to do, right? I think we're in a country right now where we're divided and we want to point fingers. And I think, you know, I have to take a step back and ask myself, where do I fit in this? How do I care for myself in order to be there for my kids? Because if I'm, you know, I got gluten allergies, you know, I'm allergic to everything in this world, right? So I can barely eat a sandwich without like coughing and getting red eyes, right? So I think we just got to talk about care, compassion, connection, and a part of that care is social, you know, having people like Kim, Wendy, and Chad, the chat with people that can kind of validate your experience so you don't have to always explain yourself or you don't feel like you're defending yourself in those PD meetings when you say, hey, there are some kids out there who are working. They can't come to the screen right now. They're taking care of their grandma or they're out there working at Walmart so they won't be in today. I still count them as present. You know, you're still here, right? Even though you're not physically on the screen. So not to preach, but I think uh, this work, especially now, is really challenging us and inviting us to be really spiritual and to think about our own internal well-being and how we can connect with ourselves as well as connect with others. No, I... I the three of you are keeping these teachers inspired. They're thanking you so much in the chat and the questions. And so um, I will be respectful of time. We have a few minutes left. So I'm going to ask another question and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, with everything that you had mentioned, Kim and Darius and Wendy, just the current fractured state of America, um, how do you envision COVID, social justice, anti-racism, politics manifesting itself in the classroom this fall? And I mean, Darius teaching the young kids, it's very different than teaching the high schoolers versus teaching the middle schoolers and the adults. So where do the three of you see that taking form? Let me go first. So I think that um, we have to be extremely intentional. And I think that Darius, the word care has to start where it all stems from how are we caring and loving one another. 
But yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was trying to explain, I am a white woman, but I teach in a school predominantly students of color. Um, I am actually the mother of three black sons whom I adopted from Soweto, South Africa. And our school for about six years, we've been very intentional. Uh, we've been around for 13 years. We've been doing work for 13 years, but if I'm honest about the past, past six years, really intentional about studying, about reading, about having conversations about race, about creating an anti-racist space, about decolonizing our curriculum, about all those kinds of things. It's, and it's, we're about six years in and we're still got so far to go. And so I think one thing that we have to acknowledge because some schools have never done the work um, is that you've got to start somewhere, but you, you've got to keep in this for the long haul. I know that there are teachers who have read every book they can get their hands on this summer, which is great, but a lot of these books have been around for years and years and years and years. So we understand that sometimes reading these things too, you've got to give yourself time to digest it but what you've got to keep asking yourself as an educator is if I now have knowledge I didn't have before, I'd never heard of redlining. And if you don't know what redlining is, you've got to know what redlining is. So you need to read that. But I didn't know what that is, but now I do. So how does that apply to my perspectives, the viewpoints, what I take into my classroom? And I think we got to keep taking it through that lens. And the other thing is that um, those conversations, you have to understand that that whole idea of care first, creating environments where people love one another, take care of one another, speak to one another with respect. You have to have that trust first to really be able to have some of those difficult conversations. And it's exhausting. And can I just say one thing to, to my white brothers and sisters out there? Y'all, it is important to surround yourself with people who are not just like you and to have conversations. I mean, that, that's, that's an important piece of the work. I've said that for years, but right now, BIPOC people, they're, they're tired. And, they, and so as much as we feel the weight of COVID, I can only imagine, because I'm a white woman and I will never know what it is to be black or to be a person of color, but this conversation is new for some of us who are listening. But people of color have been having, this has been messages that we've been told for generations of pain. And so we've got to understand that I think there's a lot of us who are white who are trying to say, tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. But it's like, there are books that you can read. There are documentaries you can watch. There are articles that you can read and do the groundwork first and then maybe go to have the conversation instead of expecting your education to have to come from someone else. There, you want to listen to the voices of others but take advantage of the have how that's already been poured out in literature and movies and things like that and do your work we have to do our work first and then last thing i'll say because i get i'm passionate about this is that um it's not just for those of us who are white who teach students of color if you are a white teacher and you teach in an all-white school you need this as much or maybe even more so because you've got to make sure that you're raising up a generation of students who can also do the work and read and study and listen. And so that's an important factor too. It affects every one of us in this country, every one of us on this planet. Yes, and I wanna say very quickly, and I know Darius, you are chomping at the bit, so this will be very short, is that with my children, I've tried to kind of mitigate somewhat of the, the pain, because the pain is there, it is obvious. And then how do you incorporate compassion and passion and reality and possibility? Just how do you make sure that all of those things are there? And sometimes that can be difficult. Yeah, it's like short, man. I, uh, I, do, I do this thing on Instagram Live where I have this conversation with my, uh, my thought partner and we have these deep conversations, so I'm not gonna go all out. Um, but first and foremost, I want people to be comfortable with the fact that education, our jobs are politicized, right? I know people say, don't talk about politics, religion, race, but that's our lives for a lot of us. If we don't talk about race, that's our lives, that's life or death. Um, so, you know, embrace that teachers are activists. We are activists, right? We may not be out there protesting on the streets, but we are doing some activist work, some liberation work in our classroom. So I think once you, Think, see teaching from that point of view, it's a little more liberating and emancipating because then you're like, oh my God, am I gonna say anything wrong? And two, I think the more that we can be in communion with our young people, being participants and facilitators as opposed to the sage on the stage, right? Um, because it's, I, I came from an all boys school in Texas. So you can imagine all the crazy stuff I learned. So if anything, I'm unlearning so much stuff, right? I'm still learning pronouns and gender pronouns. I'm reading a, I'm reading a book right now 
on pregnancy. I don't have kids, you know, I don't have a wife, but I'm reading about how our healthcare system is, makes uh, pregnant women vulnerable population. Um, so I want to say that, you know, uh, with these conversations, our kids come in with experiential knowledge that we have to honor, right? And so I can give them all the million dollar terms like white supremacy and heterogeneity. I can give them all the big terms. Our kids have the, they have the brilliance. I'm just here to guide and let them know that like, yo, this is a scam, right? White supremacy, patriarchy, those things are scams. They hurt. Oh, Darius, I think you- uh, That doesn't mean uh, the goes away. So I think if anything, guys, treating it like a virus and be like, hey, we all got to talk through it. And, you know, I want to honor your truth and you honor my truth. And we can, we can build something together as opposed to calling each other out of this whole dumb thing around cancel culture. I want a culture of redemption, a culture of inclusion, and a culture of just collaboration and empowerment. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. But before I do, that was so amazing. And I'm reading all the chats. And I mean, truly, the three of you have inspired me. And I can't echo enough what Kim has said, that you have to surround yourself with people that feed your soul. And the three of you have definitely done that. It's been a privilege in the last 30 or so minutes to have this conversation. But before I open it to the audience and you throw your questions in the Q&A tool on the bottom of the Zoom, do each of you want to share where our teachers can find and connect with you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, other social apps, LinkedIn? Um, I, I leave that to you three. For me, it's very simple. <laughs> Just through Facebook, Wendy R. Thomas, and LinkedIn, Wendy Thomas. And uh, you can look at the whole Quizlet um, just agenda and see my name in Quizlet and um, Facebook. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Quizlet, sorry, um, Facebook and uh, Lin, um, what did I say? Just, uh, and then, um, Quizlet, no, so sorry, Tender. No, <laughs> I keep saying Tender. <laughs> Why am I thinking oh, so Tender? Crazy, what? Maybe there's something. Oh, okay. So, Facebook and LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I keep saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's Zoom brain. It happens to all of us. Like you'll go blank. You're love it. It's, it it's just like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm doing so well. All right, Kim. <laughs> cute today, Wendy. <laughs> Tinder. Oh man. So I am Kim Bearden. It's bear be like a bear, E A R D E N. And I'm at Kim Bearden on Instagram, on Facebook, on uh Twitter, on everywhere. I'm I'm at Kim Bearden. Also, though, at Ron Clark Academy, if you're interested, we do all different kinds of professional development for educators. Some of it we do free online, some of it is paid, but we, there's a whole variety of different things we offer. Some of it is about how to teach in your classroom and how to build your climate culture, but some of it is how to teach virtually and lessons on ways that you can do that as well. So um, you can follow at Ron Clark Academy as well to learn more about that. Uh, I am Darius White on LinkedIn. I put in my little bio in the chat Essentially, my Instagram is kind of where I get most of my leverage. Um, it's at the other English teacher, all when we're at the other English teacher. Um, again, I'll put it in the chat for you all uh, so you can see all my social media handles. And then Darius, Darius and I have some plans for uh, getting that Instagram and the quiz at Instagram. So we will chat there. Um, awesome. So I we have about like five or so minutes left for questions. I will ask it to the panel. And then if, again, um, if anyone attending this has questions, throw it in the Q&A tool. So the first question I think it would be useful to our teachers is, what are your strategies in finding balance between work and home while working from home? Instead of parentheses, always being on. It's hard, isn't it? And I think now it's even harder because how do you compartmentalize because you're in the same space all day long and it's very, very hard. So I've always tried to say this, you know, I think that we see images that you're, a lot of us are supposed to be, you know, a wife, you're a mom, you're a teacher, you're a, you have all, we all, every person on here has multiple job descriptions of what we do and multiple roles that we have. So what I've had to learn for myself is I say, I try to never try to be at all, but in the moment, try to be all in. And by that, mm. what I mean is that I, right now, you all are my focus, right? And, and so everybody right here, this is my focus. Now, if I look over here and let myself get distracted, I can look at, I got a whole bunch of stuff sitting right over here that I need to be doing. But in the moment, sometimes it's even the 
quality of those moments, you know, it's better to give somebody 10 minutes of your undivided attention than give them an hour of where you're typing and talking and doing everything else. I've even had to learn that like, you know, if, if I'm trying to be in work mode, but my son comes down and says, I need to talk to you. I have to physically turn my computer away from me so that I don't get tempted to keep answering. And if I'm in the middle of an email, I might say, sweetie, you need my undivided attention. So let me finish this one sentence and then you have it. And so I'll finish that sentence, turn the computer, and then I say, okay, I'm all yours. What do you need? And sometimes it's just a moment, but that's so much more um, beneficial than trying to be everything at once. And then you also have to give yourself a break. Like if somebody, I used to want my house to be, everything be perfect. Perfect is boring and nobody's perfect. And so don't go by what social media makes you think. Everybody doesn't have it together. And if somebody comes to my house and there's dishes in my sink, then you know what? If they have a problem with that, then they're the ones with the problem. So you that's, got to, <laughs> that's right. You, just, so you exactly. have to grant yourself grace. That's a big thing. Love I it. agree. There is Wendy, ways that you're balancing home and work. I think it may be obvious for me. Just keep it funny. Keep it um, light. Uh, there's so many opportunities to just laugh at yourself. And, um, and just know, you know, this too shall pass or maybe it won't. And, um, and then it's all good. I would say invest in some good headphones because my <laughs> neighbors are doing construction from March till now, and there's just sawing and all types of things. So invest in some good headphones. Also, make sure you get out your house and walk, <laughs> all right? Because I know my legs go to sleep, and I get these aches. I'm getting old, man, so the knees can't handle sitting down for hours. So make sure you get up and walk, run, I don't know, trot, ride a scooter, go walk your dog. I agree. There's where the same age you are not getting that old. You need to calm down with that. <laughs> When it rains, Chad, I can feel it in my elbows. Well, it's going to be a long day, y'all. I mean, Darius and I, not to put us on blast, just turned 30. And I will say I can tell, but we ain't that old. So come down with all the my knees. You are not. Look, look, I've been teach Let me put it this way. I've been teaching for 33 years. Thank so you, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. And um, yes. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, panel. I'll respect everyone's time. Thank you, everyone that attended. Again, this will be recorded and put on YouTube. It was so great. I mean, Kim, Darius, and Wendy, you have inspired me and you fed everyone's soul in this presentation. And I definitely look forward to connecting post-COVID in person. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Have everyone else attending a conference, enjoy your lunch break. Uh, we'll be back at 1225 for a presentation from Dan Fiore and School Specialty. So. Um, thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon and have a thank great you, rest of your day. Yes. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Darius. Okay. Right, take care.